Good Saturday morning. This is again 1 Corinthians, okay? But you can see this is again, it's a wisdom literature. That's what he says. Consider your own calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you are wise by human standards. Think of who he's talking to. Not, uh, not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. You're, but he's, you're, uh, you're average. You're just human beings. There's nothing special about you beyond, okay? Rather, God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise. Think of the apostles. Think of Christ himself hanging on the cross. God chose the weak of the world to shame the strong, the death of the apostles. This is an early letter, though, but by now they're not martyred, I don't believe, okay? But think of Christ crucified, the Good Friday. God chose the lowly and the despised of the world, those who count for nothing, to reduce to nothing those who are something, so that no human being might boast before God. Christ is a nobody. He's a nobody on the cross. That is the death of the loser. That's the lowly and the despised, the cursed. He changed the world, you see? It's due to him that you are in Christ Jesus, God. It is due to Christ, God that you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, as well as righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that it is, so that as it is written, whoever boasts should boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord because it is in Christ that we are wise. Remember, he's talking to one of the centers of wisdom in the world, okay? If not the world, it's Greece and Athens, okay? Whole, I mean, Greece and Corinth and the great cities of, the great cities of, of, of Greece. Holy moly, Andy. And he's not, thwart, he's not casting away their wisdom, but it isn't the final wisdom. The final wisdom is Christ and the embracing of Christ himself through the Holy Spirit not piety, it's the wisdom of the cross. Into the world is foolishness, but to those who believe, it is the wisdom of God, and I really, truly believe that. I make a living out of looking at philosophical thought and the great thinkers who I admire beyond, and I, I, I'm, I'm not a theologian, I am a half-baked philosopher. I am a philosopher by both temperament and by training and education. I love the great ideas. And I love ideas, I have no question. And I think philosophically more than, I, you know, I could say more than theologically. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. But I know the limitations of human wisdom because the confrontation with the evil, the, the confrontation with evil and death is so major, so significant that it destroys wisdom. See, that's the trouble. If you say, let me show it to you, death annihilates both good and evil. Unless God is transformed, unless uh, death is transformed into some life, then life is unjust. If it's not, and I'm not saying that well. If death is final, there is no justice. You can say, what about this world? The justice world. And so what's the difference? What's the difference? What's the difference if you're Hitler or Mother, Mother Teresa? You're both dead. So What? So you've influenced four or five generations, so what? It's still going to evaporate into nothingness. But if you see in Christ, in the crucified Christ, the ultimate wisdom of God, then you recognize that there is a final order of things. There is a final, in a sense, justice, a, a final proper order when all things are made right. And that the suffering of the world is redeemed. And there is a final justice. There's a final accountability for life granted through the mercy of God. Still a final rectitude. A final goodness. That goodness will transcend over evil, life over death, wisdom over foolishness. You can't get that without the transformation of death into life. And that requires, and that truly requires Good Friday. There's no escaping the devastation and the annihilation of time. It not only annihilates the individual, time and death annihilates meaning. In the long run, it wipes it all out. And my, some things have value longer, art, philosophy, thought, to a degree, to a degree but never forever. 
Time is perpetual perishing. That's what Alfred North White had said, a great line in philosophy. Time is perpetual perishing. But in Christ, time is transformed into eternity, and eternity saves time from demolition. <laughs> the demolition of reality. I didn't say that well. I hang on to my faith so I can hang on to hope that life has meaning, that there is a final rectitude to things, there's a final justice. How could you look at the 20th century and not hope? Without the crucified Christ, there is no way you can look at the horrors of the 20th century and still have hope. I don't see how you can do it. What just what form of rectitude could ever be achieved without in some manner the resurrection and the beatification of the sufferers of this world and the justice of those who did it? There has to be a right order of things. There has to be an accountability. In the end of the movie, The Godfather, what does Michael say to Carlo, his son-in-law, his brother-in-law? You got to answer, Carlo. You got to answer for Sonny. And I really believe that we have to answer. And if we're willing to answer, there is the hope of forgiveness. If we're not, you got to pay the price. The price is what you chose. When I think of Hitler in the bunker blowing his brains out, I see not a redemptive moment. It maybe God does, but I don't. What I see is what he brought on this earth, the slaughter of 60 million people, okay? I can't look at that without some hope that the victims have been redeemed and been given life and justice. And those who did it, unless in their last breath they beg for forgiveness, they have to answer. I said one time in a passionate moment, if there is no hell, there is no God. Not that I want to see anybody in hell, but there has to be a final justice or life is meaningless. A final rectitude, a final order of things in which good triumphs over evil, life over death. I believe that. I believe we have to account. We are accountable for the lives we have lived under the mercy and love of God, but on the honesty of truth as well. There has to be a right order of things. Our life is really absurd. The existentialists in the 1930s, in the wake of the First World War, spoke of life as absurd. Sartre and others, life's absurd. If you're, not, if you're an atheist, in the end, and you're honest with about life, you have to say it's absurd because there's no justice. There is no justice and no hope of justice because time knocks out that possibility through death the perishing of time. But if time perish, time doesn't perish, but time is caught up in eternity, and it's a personal eternity, the person of Christ himself, that in Christ, through Christ, and with Christ, we have hope that goodness triumphs and justice is in order, a final ultimate rectitude to, for all things, a final meaning to existence itself.